this this uh, kind of bliss uh, experience that it actually results in a kind of compression that makes the connection to a larger body into oneness. And how that works is the topic of tonight's little presentation. I have some visuals as well. Good. Okay, let's go to the next question. Within the infinite Tao, cohering the pressure continuum, would you like to just explain cohering the pressure continuum? Well, it, it's a useful terminology, actually, because we're saying the universe is a geometry of pressure only, which is another way of saying the unified field is, a ma is made of a single contiguous compressible media, which behaves as a superfluid and is named charge. And compression and rarefaction, literally a pressure continuum, is the descriptor, descriptor which differentiates charge, basically uh, yin and yang in Roger's language. And so what connects the nodes of that pattern, that array of pressures in that continuum is the wave mechanics of oneness. And that's going to get us down to what is perfect compression and what is fractality. Uh, Roger's suggestion here of complementary forces implies one thing, that in effect, if the universe is made of a single compressible fluid, the unified field, which I call charge, a complementary would be plus and minus charge, literally compression and rarefaction, and quite literally yin and yang. Uh, the concept of entropy and negentropy would then arise under certain circumstances when compression is enabled and becomes implosive, then those waves at center become negentropic or self-organizing because effectively you can't get through the center without being sorted. <laughs> and that so maybe that, just uh, just describe entropy first and then negentropy. Uh, that's good. Yes. So entropy is naming the principle of the tendency toward disorder, obviously, and negentropy then names the tendency toward order, which is to say self-organization. Now physics had generally considered the universe as a whole is entropic, that is to say, is falling down. I think there's a movie by that title. <laughs> but we, we uh, physics has named one system called phase conjugation in optics, which has been measured negentropic, which is to say self-organizing. And we've extended that, made phase conjugation broad spectral to say many things in our universe can be negentropic and self-organizing if that conjugation of phases that adding and multiplying is made broad spectral. Practical example, the Schumann harmonics, that cascade, which is also golden ratio times Planck, is called a phase conjugate pump wave. And in fact, that is implosive. And in fact, we believe that literally the Schumann cascade of harmonics, phase conjugate pump wave, are what makes Gaia Earth negentropic, which Lovelock documents. He says, yes, Earth appears to be self-organizing. We think so we know why. The, you'd have to describe what the Schumann resonance, I know what it is, but you're speaking to an audience here where every any new word or term you have to actually define first, Dan. So <laughs> well, that's good. Well, you know, and that was in the slideshow I prepared, but basically the Schumann harmonics, many things, which is the Earth's natural resonance frequency. And it's true, its base has to do with how the speed of light divides into the circumference of the planet. But actually, it's not just around eight hertz. It's a whole cascade of harmonics, uh, three, uh, eight, and then uh, up to 30 and even 50 hertz. That whole cascade, and if you map that cascade of harmonics, which is the Schumann resonance series, it looks like a caduceus and, in fact, the actual frequencies of the Schumann harmonic cascade are very, very close to multiples of golden ratio times Planck, which is my work that the Planck wavelength is the musical key signature of every wave physics has ever measured, which is the, the, the black hole which links 
and makes oneness. <laughs> uh, and so if you take Planck and multiply by golden ratio, you get not only the Schumann harmonics, but everything negentropic and perfect charge collapse. And that's called PlankFire.com. <laughs> okay, Dan, we'll, we'll, we'll just uh, see if there's any questions with the terminology so far from our audience. So uh, any questions so far? I like it. Roger is keeping us to the simple basics and understandable. <laughs> All good. So, so far we've got, you know, people say God, some people say infinite, oneness, Tao. Uh, and Dan's been putting that into a terminology that it's like a, a fluid. The, uh, the right. universe is like a fluid with charge, with spin. Right. And some people call that the ether. Right. It's true. Uh, yeah. Just like in Taoism, then that's operating by these complementary forces. Now we've been using yin and yang and expansion and contraction, but often this term entropy is aligned with centrifugal because it's a dispersing energy. So things are breaking down and going back to disorder. And Dan made the point that basically we were only taught entropy in our science class at high school. They never taught us neg entropy, which is the equal and opposite force of centripetal force, bringing things coherent back to order, uh, to the center again. So, so far, so good. <laughs> and, and he mentioned the Schumann frequencies, which in layman's terms is the breath of Mother Earth. It's the harmonic uh, sequence uh, resonance uh, of Mother Earth. Uh, which it is, is well uh, it's established in the scientific literature. Okay. It, Roger, uh, so we have one question here, Dan. I was, I was just going to say that when Roger mentioned centripetal versus centrifugal, it is ironic that our science teachers didn't mention centripetal. Maybe they were embarrassed because they don't know the cause of anything centripetal, including gravity and consciousness and uh, electronegativity. They don't know why anything is centripetal. So obviously your physics teacher couldn't teach you how centripetal forces make negentropy. Oops, they were embarrassed. <laughs> go, go ahead with the question. Okay, right now. Quick question. I don't know if he can hear you. Yeah, but just uh, I'll repeat the question. 7.83 hertz. Is that a constant frequency? It is. You know, people like Greg Braden say the Schumann is going up. and But the 7.83 is what the Schumann always returns to by averaging because that does, in fact, describe how the speed of light divides into the circumference. So if you ring Earth like a bell, it's pretty fundamental. So that, that frequency is not increasing. Actually, Greg Braden is wrong, but he's right about one thing. The number of harmonics contained in the Schumann cascade does increase, that is to say, the overtones. And that harmonic inclusiveness, in fact, it determines when the Earth itself becomes more centripetal. Interestingly, if you use the equation to calculate what the Schumann frequency should be, the equation comes out to 7.29 hertz Planck times golden ratio, where the actual measured frequency is 7.83. And if you continue that difference between the theoretical and actual, it actually predicts the frequencies we measured in Bosnia at 53 and 28 kilohertz. So the Earth tried to be perfectly centripetal and it was close. <laughs> right. Well, look, we'll move on to some of the other uh, terminologies here. So. Uh, we've heard Einstein's, you know, spooky action at a distance or what a lot of people now calling in the consciousness, what is consciousness move, movement, non-local. Uh, so just describe what, what is, what did uh, Einstein, uh, you know, what was he talking about when he said uh, spooky action and what's the concepts of non-local? Uh, this is great because this is exactly where I wanted to go with this and the few little pictures that I prepared as well is perfect. So yes, uh, when Einstein called action at a distance spooky, because I suppose it might be because he never figured out why objects fall to the ground, when we know today that gravity waves are made of longitudinal or scalar waves, and he didn't understand that. And also he didn't understand how fractality enables compression. So Einstein did wonderful work, but there's some things where he really screwed up. And one of them was spooky action at a distance. In fact, 
Um, the enabling of action at a distance is exactly what I want to talk about because that's what enables oneness. So if we understood action at a distance, we could be, begin to understand the linkages which create oneness. Very important question. And yes, exactly what we're saying is when there is implosion or centripetal force, that compression at center converts the transverse or up and down electromagnetics, which are less ordered because the axis of vibration is perpendicular to the direction of compression versus when the waves reach, reach center. And we now know what that is. It's called the Planck threshold. That up and down wave motion is converted. Called translation of vorticity. Visualize a conduceus on the cone. I got great pictures. And so when that compression of the transverse wave goes down the side of the vortex cone correctly. It simply looks like a caduceus on a cone. What's squeezed out the center of that toothpaste tube is a wave which is organized in what's called longitudinal or scalar or compressional, where the, the vibration is parallel to the direction of propagation. This is called longitudinal or scalar. This is so important. Because that organized compressional wave, if you visualize this process, supposing you were trying to squeeze a nucleus or squeeze your lover. Well, if you got waves converging from opposite sides and they're compressional or longitudinal, you could introduce symmetrical squeezing or implosion. For example, what gravity waves are made of. Whereas if that wave was up and down or transverse and it arrived at center, it would not symmetrically squeeze or create implosion. And when you create that squeezing or implosion, you connect to the longitudinal waves, which travel in a pattern called fractal. And actually, in the picture of me on the top left here of this slide, you see the star mother kit, Dodeki Ikosa. And that is the geometry longitudinal waves have to propagate because they only then share that momentum at the nodes, the nodes of that, what's called the fractal array. And this is the clue to how we're going to talk about oneness is how the longitudinal nodes connect at the nodes of that array. And in fact, we know that in the Earth grid, Dodeca Ecosa, for example, Karatka proved that telepathy generally is mostly available only <laughs> at those cross points, the Earth grid sacred sites, the Dodeca Ecosa nodes of the Earth grid, where the longitudinal waves meet. So why is it that telepathy, military quality, is generally only available at those nodes, the same place where cathedrals and labyrinths and stone circles work, and the, the same place that uh, nuclear critical mass is reduced per Kathy. So getting to know that array, that grid, that fractal nest, is an introduction to the physics of oneness. Now, just to try to finish Roger's question a little bit here, how does that enable action at a distance? And how do we answer Einstein's dilemma? Well, the physics is that at the compressional nodes, a series of harmonics faster than the speed of light, actually by golden ratio multiples, times the speed of light, and Professor Raymond Chow did some measurements, they centered around golden ratio times C, that's a smoking gun times the speed of light. And those multiple superluminal velocities in that connective array means, <laughs> It seems like it's instantaneous communication. Hint, action at a distance. More practically, if you take phase conjugate microwaves to create those nodes, for example, you can contain heat at a distance, as when Ingo Swan heated that thermistor with his mind at a distance through a Faraday cage, measured multiple times, which is why our tech is called flameinmind.com. So that was spooky action at a distance. There's Ingo Swan sitting there with his mind, heating that thermistor, heating a flame with his mind at a distance through a Faraday cage. Oh, was that spooky? No, that is the physics of longitudinal interferometry. And if you do that with microwaves, you can contain heat at a distance at those nodes because the transverse exchanges an inertia with the longitudinal at those wave nodes and the transverse are the heat containing. So you can bounce the compression containing back to the inertia of the heat containing only at the nodes, which means you could contain heat at a distance if you understood how to use the longitudinal array. And that is how Tesla actually screwed up 
when he wanted to create global wireless power. He didn't have the frequency right. He didn't know to golden, golden ratio times Planck. And he didn't get the nodes accurately on the array, which is the only pickup points. So the global pyramid grid did create beautiful, useful global wireless power, and Tesla did not. That was action at a distance. Okay, well, you, you got some nice video uh, uh, images uh, on your presentation there. Yes, so let's yes, just go through. So uh, just describe, a lot of people don't even know what the golden mean ratio uh, is here, Dan. So just, uh, just describe what the golden mean ratio is. Yes, uh, so uh, there's only one particular harmonic series, uh, 1.618, 2.618, et cetera, where you can take any two numbers and add them to get the following, or you can take any two numbers and multiply that. Actually, you could take any number and multiply it by golden ratio, 1.618, and get the following. That's called recursive adding and multiplying. Remember, recursive adding is multiplying. And it's called arithmetic and geometric series. That's long known. And it's long known that that is the symbol of beauty. What is not long known, which we prove by equation, that is the solution, the solution to constructive wave interference. Oh, new information. We wrote those equations. And therefore, the solution to compression. <laughs> the solution to compression is basically the solution to every problem physics has ever named. The solution to fusion, the solution to alchemy, the solution to light going, taking memory through death, the solution to urban design, the solution to the history of computing. It's all the solution to compression. So once you wrote the equation to prove golden ratio is the solution to compression, it's that's not only the solution to beauty. <laughs> no, it's the cause of gravity. It's the cause of consciousness because it's the cause of charge collapse. So yeah, golden ratio is a little bit important. I guess. <laughs> okay. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next slide is so. Um, most people think particles exist. Do they exist? Well, you know, I, I used to say, whoever invented cities should apologize. And then I would say, whoever invented particles should apologize. <laughs> Actually, what exists is a envelope made of waves. And so particles really don't exist. It's actually true. What exists is an envelope that contains a nest of waves. And the coherence of the envelope is the illusion of what we call a particle. What weaves them together is the nodes of the longitudinal array. For example, an electron is basically a, a, a slip knot. It's a little black hole. Or hydrogen is a, is a, is a wave nest. But I think, I think, Roger, what I'd like to do now is go to those uh, slides. I'll tell you what, Dan, let, let's just finish my slides, and then I can hand, or, hand, hand it over to you. So let's As just... You as you wish. Uh, so tell us a little bit uh, about Planck's length and the hydrogen and golden mean ratio. Yes. Well, so remember, we said Planck is the unit of length and time into which every wave and in physics divides evenly. It is the musical key signature in length and time and energy, actually, uh, of the universe. That is the musical key signature. So it is the fundamental metric of the quantum foam. So it's not by coincidence that also at the Planck threshold on the squirt gun down the pine cone that the transverse becomes longitudinal and that's where you make gravity. And that's uh, Roger's next question here that we were the first to discover that if you take Planck, and I wrote this new equation, the first time ever we proved how and why hydrogen is fractal, and therefore how and why hydrogen makes gravity. This is new information. I discovered if you take Planck and keep multiplying by golden mean ratio, integer exponents of golden mean ratio, you get three exact radii of hydrogen. Hello, this is a smoking gun. It's a nest of pentacles, literally. And that fractality allows the implosion within hydrogen named gravity. Many physicists already suspect that fractality causes gravity, but no one until me has considered the issue practically of what is a fractal electric field, sometimes named fractalfield.com. And there is your proof that hydrogen is fractal. It literally looks like a rose. 
Okay, you used the term superluminal before. Uh, yeah. Just define it for folks. And it's a very controversial area in physics. So, but just Well, actually, actually experienced physicists are very aware that thousands or maybe millions of measurements have been made of waves traveling faster than light. It's So Einstein was clearly wrong about another thing. The speed of light ain't a speed limit. Nope, he's wrong. <laughs> uh, but it's also true that the most famous measures by Professor Raymond Chow showed that the, showed that the most common measurements of speeds faster than light are all centered between 1.5 and 1.7 times C, the speed of light, centered beautifully around golden mean ratio, 1.618 times C, which I say is a smoking gun because when the wave lengths converge in golden ratio, the form of compression that enables acceleration towards center in going through the speed of light is that golden ratio allows waves to add and multiply recursively constructively, not just wave length, but also phase velocity, the speed of the wave front. So now if there's a permissive path named golden ratio, to allow waves to add and multiply their wave speed, then only with golden ratio, you could convert compression towards center into acceleration towards center. The name for that phenomena of the acceleration of charge towards center, there's a technical name, it's called gravity. <laughs> That's the cause of gravity. So that, that if you, once you have a path through the speed of light and out through that center comes a longitudinal wave, which is what gravity waves are made of. Well, um, we're halfway through the presentation. We could, I can stop sharing here and maybe you, let's get some of your images up, Dan. You can uh, share your screen now, yeah? Yeah, so we wanted to show the example of when the squeezing is done right, the implosion, it creates a, a compression phenomena literally in the DNA that creates that implosion and spits out that coherent longitudinal wave. So if you plot the path of golden ratio towards center, you get the holy grail, of course, and you've all seen that. So that path of golden ratio down a helix, which is named DNA, is a solution to implosive compression. So when you have these low frequency sound harmonics, love in your heart, your DNA recursively braids based on golden ratio and implodes. In fact, that path of implosion, lattice cognitive tunnel spiral in recursive braiding in DNA is literally the actual map you will see when you die because your DNA has to recursively braid implode to successfully make the little black hole required for successful death. Why? Because you need to fit into that compression array called longitudinal, which is where you go when you dream and when you die, because that is the wave mechanics of oneness. So this braiding pattern DNA, the, the, the thread is braided into string, into, that's braided into rope, and that's braided into fat rope. And so this is our measurement of the low frequency harmonics in the EKG at the moment of love, thanks to Glenn Ryan, before and after right here, of the density of the braiding of DNA. So when you implode the DNA down this little wave path, something is spit out. And that's what the next series of slides is. The result of braiding in DNA is actually that down this particular light cone, and I think it's slide number 38, I hope I got it right here, um, that you get the, yeah, here it is, okay. Oh, that's French. Oops. Okay. <laughs> that's for tomorrow's talk. I'm here with Elena Denon in, in Tours, France, and this is all prepared in French as well. So uh, this is the wave mechanics. So when your DNA braids like this down, remember I said I could caduceus down a cone, what squeezed out the squirt gun at this Planck center is a longitudinal wave. And that longitudinal wave looks like this. Oops, let's use the English version. So it creates a compression wave and the symmetry of those compression waves can concentrically squeeze center, whereas these transverse waves cannot squeeze the center, cannot implode, and can't spit out that longitudinal wave at the center. And that's the point. It's a longitudinal wave at the center that does the work. So this is the frequency signature we use in Therify. This is my invention uh, of this harmonic cascade, which we use in Therify. This is the infrasound we feed. These are the harmonics that Prior used here. Uh, and so this, 
Low frequency cascade produces this implosion at this Planck threshold here in the red circle. And out the center comes this coherent longitudinal wave. And you all know what the Therify is. And so, but the reason that we are able here, this is a point that I really want to make. So here is the evidence that we can uh, consistently create lucid dreaming with the same compression wave called Therify conjugate plasma. And here's the university published literature on what frequencies cause lucid dreaming. And here's how, how th those frequencies fit my equation. And here's our report of creating lucid dreaming using Therify. Now, why do I get ex so excited about this lucid dreaming thing? I'm going to stop the share for just a second. So here's the point. Many people believe that if you can lucid dream, it pretty well predicts who's going to take memory through death. And so we know why we can trigger lucid dreaming, because we can make the squeezing imploding the body, and the body emits this coherent longitudinal or scalar, which in Egypt was called the Ba from the Ka, I believe. Uh, the Gurdjieff called it the Kezjan body. The Tibetans called it the rainbow light body. But what's the physics? What you're making is a coherent longitudinal array that embeds you into that nest, which is the beginning of the possibility of real connectivity, real oneness, becoming literally part of a larger body. Remember, lucid dreaming in the aboriginal sense of ancestor phone calls and dream track song lines is literally god <laughs> so if you could if you could the aboriginals are sitting there lucid dreaming every day well what are they accomplishing they're embedding in that array so once we know the physics of what happens when compression is successful your body spits out that coherent longitudinal and at the time of death let me give you another example Medrick here in, in Perpignan was very convinced multiple occasions that Therify, the plasma, phase conjugate implosive centripetal plasma, was literally able to help release stuck ghosts. What does that mean? Well, here you got this longitudinal array, and if at the moment of death you don't get the little compression black hole correct, you don't get enough inertia centripetal force to embed in that array. There's a sorting of memories required for the compression experience called successful death. For example, anger is a wave shape, one over seven, which does not compress well, meaning it ain't going through death. Sorry. <laughs> so the centripetal inertia it requires to embed in that array is the mini, mini black hole required for successful death. A sacred spot would be useful. Raymond Moody famously <clears throat> showed that the deaf visions are electrically contagious. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, the surgeon standing around the person dying, they all see the same thing. What happened? Is that DNA radio? Could that be the array? Maybe that's the beginning of oneness. So the death experience requires this centripetal compression. We can help people die well by helping with that compression field, the same compression field that replicably triggers lucid dreaming. Now, I say this is the introduction to the true physics of soul. What we had been calling soul is the long-term memory that's enabled by connectivity and embedding in that array. We've talked about collective unconscious and communion of saints and Champs-Élysées. We have all these names, but once we have the electrical engineering, we can teach universities and governments what a soul is. It's longitudinal coherence. And when you can teach universities and governments what a soul is, literally, electrically, by measurement, what it is you take with you through death, the coherence of that array coming out of your aura, the ba from the ka, suddenly universities and governments could begin to make decisions which are not soulless. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> so how am I doing here? Uh, good. Uh, let me just go. We'll finish our uh, presentation. A couple of technologies that you can talk about here. I've got the imploder, the uh, work you've done with biofeedback, and we'll finish off with uh, cold fusion. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the water imploder. Yeah. So we took that equation I wrote 
for the geometry of hydrogen, and after about 20 years' work, produced a nozzle we named Schauberger's Dream. It's a perfect vortex. I actually have, oh, I guess it's in the car, but it's a perfect vortex nozzle based on those 510 spirals down the perfect 60 degree light cone that nests dodecaecosa. It's literally the perfected charge collapse vortex. And when water goes down that perfected vortex, particularly if it's piezo, has a little bit of mineral, then you will have capacitive charge implosion at the throat of that nozzle, creating spin density. And of course, then we pass it through centripetal magnetics called phase conjugate magnetics. The result of that compression, implosion, and spin density is hypersolubility, and therefore high hydration, high charge distribution. And this has a dramatic effect, of course, on plant growth and people. You know that hydration is the major issue in many diseases. So we have a whole line of technologies based on implosion, very successful. The imploder is in use in many countries. Therify.net is implosion in plasma, and that's in use in 25 countries. The biofeedback aspect of this, flameandmind.com, where we measure implosion in brain waves. We didn't get to those slides, but that's how you can trigger this implosive infrasound in your brain and your heart. It's so measurable with flameandmind.com. And interestingly, at the talk I'm doing here in France tomorrow, Jean-Charles Moyen famously had that golden ratio cascade in his brain waves. So not only did he have bliss, not only could he see without his eyes, like the children do when they make that state, that implosion, that flameandmind.com. But John Charles' amplitude at golden ratio was off the charts, huge. And that's what we measured just before he regularly does teleportation with witnesses going through the array. So literally, that's the introduction to stargates and teleports. It's, it's, it's more than fusion. It's cool stuff. And it all requires understanding the longitudinal array and oneness. Sounds exciting, uh, the conference in France. But uh, Elena, we've Elena, got a more Elena. exciting retreat here in Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Dan, we'll, we'll, we'll spin everybody quickly down the cold fusion uh, wormhole here. So... Uh, just very briefly, I started to work with a uh, uh, Italian inventor, Andre Rossi, over 12 years ago. And we still have the website, ecat.tech. And if you're interested in the potential of cold fusion and understanding the dynamics of it, that's a good website because it's got uh, information about what is cold fusion and uh, what it will mean for the planet if we're able to achieve this. So there's sort of, it looks into the future as well. Uh, here's an example of what cold fusion really means. Uh, you take one barrel of nanonized nickel down the bottom there, nanonized nickel, and in cold fusion, we, we combine that with hydrogen. There's various ways of doing cold fusion, and we went down the line of using nickel. So that's the equivalent energy release as a super tanker of oil. So that's the high energy density that we're talking about. Uh, when I first started work with Andre Rossi over 12 years ago, there was virtually only one or two or three labs doing cold fusion. It got a bad rap. There was no uh, government support. Virtually there still isn't government support. And uh, people in academia, if they use the term, they would lose their job. That's how bad it was. Um, however, there was a lot of private uh, people who continued the work of Fleshman and Pons. And that was um, Time Magazine in about 1978, 79, where they kind of claimed that they had done it. We were right in the middle of the oil crisis. And these guys uh, prematurely said, oh, you know, we've kind of got cold fusion or it was a big hit, but they weren't able to replicate it. So since 79, it ha had a bad rap. Fast forward to the modern age, there's now uh, every year there's a cold fusion conference with uh, a lot of people showing up and there's now over 22 serious labs in the world, uh, well financed by people like the Japanese government and, and private investors, etc. <clears throat> so very, very quickly, uh, uh, Andre's um, ECAT, these are like little reactors. He had about a hundred of them in a uh, shipping container. And he didn't quite get there. He, you know, basically to put something on the market, it's got to work really, really well. 
and you've got to do all the due diligence and he spent years on this and the engineer you see this guy down the bottom here Fulvio got a little bit frustrated with Andre because he kept on changing his mind he'll come in and say okay we're going to do this now and poor old uh, Fulvio down the bottom see that he's building them all right he's putting his little babies together so Fulvio uh, rang me up and said, oh, Roger, 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 <laughs> Andre's driving me crazy. I want to work with you, All right? So we started to put together the Urengara. Uh, now, L-E-N-R means low energy nuclear reaction. So reaction, so that's another term. That's a more technical term for uh, coal fusion. Uh, so Urangara means it's from one of the Aboriginal tribes in Australia. It means the sun. So I thought that was a very appropriate term for our project. So Fulvio is working on the team. Uh, a wonderful American, brilliant uh, scientist, Elizabeth Donovan. Uh, Dan and I got her out of uh, Georgia. She was just like, you know, kind of rotting away in a way. And we got her out of Georgia and she's now... Uh, in Spain, our, our lab is uh, uh, in Spain, and she is absolutely brilliant. And Dan is on the team, and two other people are on the team. Uh, so that's uh, urengara.com. Now, Dan, do you have any comments about coal fusion? And we're, we're starting to wrap it up uh, here. Yes, well, it's very appropriate because it's related to our theme tonight, which is implosion or non-destructive charge collapse. And in fact, when Elizabeth Donovan wrote the most extensive series of equations in history to predict the frequency and temperature to catalyze virtually every commercially valuable isotope transition in the atomic table. So non-destructive isotope transition, which is non-destructive charge collapse, literally identifies cold fusion. What makes it cold? The same thing that made Schauberger's vortex spontaneously get colder. The heat not required for charge collapse if the geometry is basically fractal or conjugate. So developing the symmetry conditions to enable non-destructive charge collapse is literally an electrical definition of fusion. In many ways, you know, the science of alchemy, the trans trans transition from uh, mercury or lead into gold, if you plot the sequence of paths where the electron shells can collapse without loss of energy, there's a certain very specific path. Now, there's a guy named uh, uh, Joe Champion, I think, who modeled the temperature for many isotope transitions, but didn't understand the frequency. If you predict the geometry of the, of the spark gap between the quantum electron shells, that's where the word quantized come from, comes from, you begin to be able to plot a path where the charge can collapse non-destructively. Now, if you can remember the theme of tonight's conversation, PlancFire.com, it is the solution to charge collapse literally fractal field. So there's all kinds of incredible, powerful, real world, actual electrical solutions to both alchemy and fusion. Once you understand non-destructive charge collapse, it, the atom is literally a liquid and, and that ability to collapse to achieve that fusion is exactly how you make a vortex implode and spontaneously get colder. You remember, when Schauberger's vortex spontaneously got colder, that's the moment he knew he was going to get electricity from gravity, and Hitler wrote Schauberger a check for that because it worked. So that, that's an example of fusion energy, and it's a discovery of that vortex. I remember that same vortex became the mercury doped with iron, red vortex, Nazi bell, Vimana, Hanabu, and that made gravity, the same vortex, which, by the way, made gravity for the centripetal force for Schauberger as well by spitting out that longitudinal wave at center. So the question of fusion is perfectly aligned with our greater mission of understanding implosive charge collapse in fractal fields. So we're, we're very grateful to be on this team because we're having fun. Brilliant, Dan. Well, we've got a lot to cover here tonight, so uh, we might need to wrap it up, but we, we can take any sort of quick questions. Any, anybody's got any quick questions? Yes. Now, did you hear the question? Something about the nodes on the grid? Yeah. You know, you had the icosa dodeca, which yeah. would basically say that's the shape of the universe. 
Yes. And uh, so the question is about the uh, the nodes, the what you might call sacred sites. Uh, yes. So the question is how can you define that or describe that a bit more about how how do those uh, uh, how do you prove how do you prove hey it's can they be anywhere else it's it's very practical if you want to go out and make a labyrinth or stone circle or start a cathedral or find a place for a cozy rev mirror or telepathy or even find a well step 1 is to find where the magnetic lines cross and ultimately, if they do that on a planet-wide scale, you see this famous dodeca ecosa earth grid, and uh, Becker and Hagens, et cetera. There's even a plug-in for Google Earth from uh, Beth, Beth Hagens to ma map the dodeca ecosa on the earth grid. Well, famously, those are the sites where when they were going to put these famous cozy rev mirrors, where they got consistent military quality telepathy every time, step one, they went out and measured the nano Tesla magnetic flux strength of the magnetic line cross at the node to tell them whether or not they were going to get telepathy, hint, oneness at those nodes. And now it's very practical for you because I say it is survival related to be able to do basic dousing yourself. Remember, the more bliss you have, the better dowser you become because your blood becomes a waveguide, obviously. So you need to go be able to go out there and find your, your favorite field and intuit where the magnetic lines are and then walk very slowly, hands relaxed at your side. When you walk over a strong magnetic line, you definitely should feel for yourself your hair stand up, a little tingle, little presence, just as you walk over the magnetic line. And if you practice, eventually you are a basic dowser. And it's fine to hire somebody to do it. But ultimately, if you can't feel earth magnetism for yourself, ultimately you're not feeling. You're not feeling the earth. So it's very practical to be able to locate these nodes yourself. Here in South France recently, we have a rain-making and labyrinth-making project all over the area. Valerie pioneered this, and we were pretty successful, actually. And my little skill to walk around and find these magnetic nodes was a beginning for our labyrinths and rain-making projects. And you're literally finding the earth's heartbeat. So yes, finding these nodes is a survival-related skill. So the question is, can you make a local node amplify the charge yourself? Absolutely. So that's essentially what stone circles and labyrinths building is. You take paramagnetic material, you know, like limestone or quartz, piezo, and you make like they did in Brazil when the flames were approaching the village, the kids made a spiral and a labyrinth and they attracted a rainstorm just in time to save the village. True story, goldenmean.info slash rain, you can see the film. So it's, yes, you, you actually braid the magnetic lines by taking strongly dielectric and piezo material. Uh, the science is all there at the rainmaking site. And you, you amplify, it's an old story. The, the beginner dowser moves the water vein into the well by using a hammer and percuss piezo, where the advanced dowser does it differently. The advanced dowser goes in there and talks to the water vein. Hmm. Well, wonderful, Dan. That's a nice note to finish on here. And we know you're busy there at your conference yeah. as well. And we've we got a bit to cover. Paul was sitting here right next to me. Yeah. Hi, hi, Paul. Hey, our friends uh, over there, Marie and Mel, they say you got like four or five therapy orders coming in in the week. So if you could crank up a little bit, see what. All see right. what... Okay, <laughs> Mr. Dan Winter, thank you. Thank you. Blessings, blessings. See you soon. Take care. Bye bye, everybody. Bye for now, Dan. Bye bye. Enjoy, Ciao. enjoy, enjoy lovely England. <laughs> yes. <laughs>